Christmas is here, isn't it? You all know, right? How many of you um, have already decorated? Anybody? Yeah. Our house, too. Listen, the turkey wasn't even in the Ziploc bag <laughs> before the outside of our house was made Christmas, you know. Um, I don't know if this is a tradition for you, but for us, we have already watched Home Alone 2 and 3 of the 16 Tim Allen Santa movies. Anybody with me? It's on loop. It's the worst. Um, I don't know, two days ago by noon, we already had our tree up and decorated. Anybody else with me? Yeah, it's here. The marks of the season are here. Well, today, St. Paul wants to talk to us about the marks of Jesus, and since Jesus really is the reason for the season, as people say, I think it's a good way for us to wrap up our, ser our series on Galatians. Now, I've asked you through this series to bring your Bible, and I know some of you have, and I'm pretty excited for that, so it's time to pull out your Bibles, all right? If you're a highlighter or an underliner, this is what we're going to be focusing in on today. We're going to focus in on verse 17 of chapter 6, where St. Paul says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Okay, so find that phrase in your Bible and underline it and highlight it, and we're going to unpack what that means from God's Word. When St. Paul says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, a lot of people agree that what this likely means is that he's talking about how just as Jesus was persecuted for sharing the faith, so was St. Paul. St. Paul was persecuted as well. And, and that's what he means by bearing on his body the marks of Jesus. What happened to Jesus is what happens to him. Other people will say that it's because of his imprisonment, and just as Jesus was unjustly imprisoned, so Paul was unjustly imprisoned, and that's what he means by bearing on his body the marks of Jesus. So that could be all that rejection and everything. Now, some people will even go so far as to say, well, what he really means is, you know, there was a time when St. Paul was actually stoned to death which is a rough way to go, right? So he was stoned to death, and he was resurrected on the spot. And so what they seem to say is, just as Jesus bears the marks of his death and resurrection, so St. Paul bears these kind of scars from that time when he was stoned to death and resurrected. And that's what he means by, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And, and whereas all those things are, are very likely true, it's also a very resounding maybe. Yeah, things are going to get deep here at church. Watch out today, all right? So what I mean by the maybe is that it's also just as likely that St. Paul, when he's talking about, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus, it's, it's in juxtaposition, it's in contrast to the Judaizers who want the Galatian Christians to bear on their bodies the marks of the law. And so the Judaizers bear on their bodies the marks of the law, whereas Paul is saying, we bear on our body the marks of Jesus. See, the Judaizers wanted them to do all kinds of things in their flesh, and, and they wanted them to do that in order to demonstrate that they're true Christians by these marks that they bear on their body. Whereas St. Paul is saying those who live by faith in Jesus have a different kind of marking in their life. The Judaizers wanted the Galatian Christians to bear the marks of the law to prove something, but Paul is saying that we have a better badge than the merits of the law. Because what we bear in ourselves is the very life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What we bear in ourselves is his teaching, the, the faith that he's given to us. What we bear on our bodies is a new life and a new creation. And that tells a way better story than what ritual and rules and the mutilation of the flesh would look like. And so I want to talk today about what it means as a Christian to bear the mark or to bear the marks of Jesus in your life. And I'm going to use three episodes from the Bible, um, and apparently I'm stealing uh, Pastor Craig's sermon in a couple of weeks, so congratulations. Uh, this will be a lot of fun. All right, you ready? He's like, bring it along. Oh, bring it. Oh, yeah, you'll do good. Okay. All right. Anybody remember the story 
of uh, the, the woman at the well in John 4. Very common story in the New Testament. We've gone over it a couple of times. When I think of somebody who bears in their body the mark of Jesus, I think of her. And she's a great character in the New Testament because when she first meets Jesus, she totally gets in a religious debate with him. How many of you know that that's probably not going to go well? So her first thing out of the gate with Jesus is to engage him in this lively debate about um, what real, true religion looks like. And she's arguing with Jesus about this right? She's saying, well, you all say that you have to worship on Zion. We say that we have to worship over here. Which one's right, Mr. Smarty Pants? I'm like, whoa, slow down, right? And then she's like, well, hey, we've got Jacob's well. That's older than Jerusalem, so who's, who's cool now, right? And then she says, well, we know about Messiah, and we know that he's going to come. And the irony is, who is Jesus but the? Yeah, so yikes, She's literally meeting with the Messiah. And so she's trying to have a debate with Jesus about what the true faith looks like. And Jesus says, you want to know what the true faith looks like? It doesn't look like which mountain you're going to worship on. It doesn't look like what man-made well you have. It doesn't even look like what manuscript you're getting your information from. If you want to know what the true faith looks like, Jesus says, it looks like a relationship. It looks like a relationship with God through the Messiah. And then Jesus does something incredible. He actually reveals that he is the Messiah for the first time in the Gospel of John to just her. Now, we all know that this is like a terrible idea, right? If Jesus wanted to get out there that he was the Messiah, he probably should have announced that he was a Messiah, I don't know, in like a crowd, maybe at an event, maybe campaigning, maybe work on a social media. Like there's better ways to get out that he's the Messiah. But I actually really like the way that he revealed his being Messiah to to just this lonely lady at a well. It proves Jesus' point. That the true faith is not about these big shows. The true faith is about a relationship with Jesus. And when he revealed to her that he was the Messiah, that revelation, that, that moment with the Messiah changed her life forever. I think it's great because it wasn't anything that she did that got her that relationship. In fact, the only thing that she did was sit there and have a debate with Jesus, right? It wasn't about what she did, but it was about something that Jesus did for her. He revealed his love for her and his relationship, and that changed her whole life. It left a deep mark on her that changed her forever. The reason why I say it leaves a deep mark that changed her forever is because this is the kind of lady who liked to be lonely. She didn't like to be around people. Um, I'm not going to ask the introverts in the room to raise their hands because I know that they won't. (laughs) But like this lady, like loved to be alone. And I don't know if it's because she had something in her past that, that kept her away from other people. I don't know if it's because she had like an obnoxious laugh, you know, that people would like make fun of her for. But, but when Jesus Uh, entered into her life when she was in a relationship with Christ, it changed her from being a lonely person to being the biggest witness that was inviting people to know Jesus. It completely changed her life. She went from being lonely to being fulfilled in Christ. I mean, that's incredible. She didn't care what the people around her thought anymore. The only thing that mattered was Jesus. And if you're a person who feels lonely in this world, whether it's because of something in your past or or if it's because you have a really obnoxious laugh or something like that, I don't know. Or maybe you're just a hardcore introvert. I want you, you'll never be truly alone because Jesus will meet with you and he will have a relationship with you that will change your life. Something that's so much better than right observance of rituals or mountains or or manuscripts or man-made wells. When you have a relationship with Jesus like this woman did, it will take you to the cross and then to the empty tomb. When you have a relationship with Jesus, his teaching will, will move you and give you faith that will change who you are. 
When you have a relationship with Jesus, you will have a new life as a new creation. That's what it means to have the marks of Jesus on your life. Not something that you did, but something that he did for you that just changes you. All right, let's do another one. Um, how many of you remember the story of Lazarus, all right, in John 11? That's a good one. I think it's, you know, all right, don't worry. I'm not going to unpack the whole story. But one thing Lazarus knew is that um, he was a friend of Jesus. In fact, John says that Lazarus was Jesus' friend, which is awesome. How many of you want to put that on your social media now? Bob Sundquist, Jesus' friend, right? And so when Lazarus got really sick, the only thing he could think to do was to call on Jesus because Jesus is someone who can help with that. And you would think that be, being a friend with Jesus would warrant some immediacy from Jesus, that Jesus would be like, oh, it's Lazarus, and he'd get up and go right away. But he didn't. Jesus didn't get up and go right away. Jesus waited, waited for four whole days. Lazarus could not depend on his status or his social proximity to Jesus. Instead, in the end, Lazarus was scared to death. And in the end, Lazarus died. Which leaves us with this haunting question, was Jesus too late? I mean, what was Lazarus thinking towards the end? Was Jesus mad at me? Am I no longer his friend? Should I have given him that extra taco from Taco Tuesday? I mean, what's going on? I thought we were buddies. But Jesus waited, not so that he could be too late, because Jesus was not too late. He will never be too late. Jesus was going to do something for Lazarus that would mark him as not just Jesus' friend, but Jesus would do something for Lazarus that would demonstrate that Jesus is his Savior. Lazarus had nothing at the end. He called out to Jesus and he didn't have a thing in his, in, in his self that could earn him a better spot with Jesus. But it wasn't his calling out to Jesus that saved him. No, it was Jesus calling Lazarus' name out of the grave that would change his situation from dead to alive again. I mean, that's going to leave an impression on your life. Everybody remembers Lazarus' story, not because of who Lazarus was, but because Jesus knew his name and called him out of the grave. Man, that's an amazing story. Can I get an amen to that one? And what I find so powerful is that what Jesus was showing in the resurrection of Lazarus was what he himself was about to do in Jerusalem. Jesus himself was about to go and to die on a cross. Jesus himself was about to go into a tomb. And Jesus himself was going to rise again to demonstrate that he has the authority and the power to call you out of your grave because he himself has come out of his grave. I mean, there's nothing scarier than death, right? But you don't need to be afraid because even if or even when you die, Jesus knows your name and he will call you out of your grave and that is a new life and that is a new creation and that'll leave a mark on your life, amen? That's what it means to bear on your bodies the marks of Jesus. Every single one of you will bear on your bodies the resurrection power of Jesus. And that was nothing that we did, but it was something that he alone did for you. Well, okay, if we're going to talk about somebody who bears on their body the marks of Jesus, we should probably touch back on St. Paul. After all, he's the one that wrote Galatians, and it'd be kind of nice to end the series with him, right? All right, listen. Here is someone in St. Paul before his conversion. Here is someone who the Judaizers could truly be proud of, right? Because before Paul met Jesus, he was like the perfect law keeper, circumcised on the eighth day, uh, Pharisee of Pharisees, trained under like the best rabbi in the first century, Gamaliel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, when it came to the law, this guy was perfect. He was flawless at keeping it. But here was the problem. Observing the law the way that Paul did led him to actually persecute the true believers. Isn't that wild? By keeping the law, it actually led him to persecute 
the true faith. And that's why Paul got so worked up in Galatians about these Judaizers. Because by insisting that people follow the law perfectly, it led these Judaizers to actually persecuting the true Christians. And Paul knew that personally. And so it really, really bothered him. Paul was a perfect Judaizer until that day he met Jesus on that road to Damascus. When he met Jesus, his life was changed in an extraordinary way. Jesus got a hold of him and taught him that it was not by works of the law, but by faith that gives you the true faith in the Messiah that will change your life and show you the true meaning of righteousness. But Paul had this problem. His life was changed on the road to Damascus, but now he had to go out and try and like live that life in front of people who uh, saw Paul as someone whose mar life was marked by his past. Yeah, that's, I mean, try, just try and get past your past, amen? They saw St. Paul and he was like, I'm a Christian now. They're like, aren't you the guy who's all murdery, you know? <laughs> that one, right? He was marked by his past and it was hard. It was hard for him to demonstrate to, to other people that, that he was changed. But here's the great thing about St. Paul. He didn't care about his past and he never let it define him. His life was forever changed and new because he had an encounter with Jesus. I don't know what it's like for you. I don't know if you're the kind of person who like, you know, has something in your past, either something that you've done or something that, you, that had done to you or something that happened on social media and, and, and people can't seem to see you past that moment. I want you to know today that Jesus will change your life forever and you don't have to be defined by your past. People looked at St. Paul, they thought, isn't this the murderer? Jesus was shining his light through him and they said, there's something about him that's totally different. I mean, that's happened in my life. People that I knew a long time ago, although there's not that many of them alive anymore, but people I knew a long time ago, they look at me and they go, you're a pastor? And I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> But I'm always willing to share with them to say, and, and this is what happened to make that change, to make that change. Listen, you are no longer defined by your past. The marks of Christ run deep in you. His life, his death, his resurrection, it changes you, doesn't it? The teachings of Jesus, the faith that he's put in your heart, that changes your whole life. You have a new life because you are a new creation, no longer defined by who you were, but now defined by grace through faith in Christ alone. In his name, amen.